Okay, and uh, which war did you serve? The Korean War. All right. What was your branch of service? The U.S. Army. U.S. Army, okay. What was your highest rank? It was corporal. In what general location did you serve? I served in, in on the on the Korean front at, at various uh, areas. I served uh, during February of 1951 at uh, the Battle of Wanju and Han Song. Uh, the second uh, major battle we were in was what was referred to as the May Massacre. Uh, was in uh, May. 16th through the 22nd, uh, in that battle I was wounded for the first time. Uh, the third uh, battle was the Battle of the Punch Bowl, which was uh, in August and September of 1951, which I received my second wound. And do you remember the general locations, like cities of uh, Korea in which you were serving in? or? Well, the Wanju was a fairly good size uh, town, and Hong Song was also. Uh, in, in the May uh, and Punch Bowl uh, battles, we were in the mountains, and uh, there weren't too many well-known towns. There were maybe a few villages. And uh, just to kind of go back to the beginning, uh, when were you drafted? Were you drafted or were you enlisted? No, I uh, volunteered. I enlisted. Okay. And uh, where were you living at the time you were enlisted? I was living in Groton, Connecticut at the time. Okay. And uh, do you recall the date in which you were enlisted? Uh, it was July 17th, 1950. Okay. And what, what was the reason of you joining the Army? I was going. To, I was prepared to make it a career. I signed under a career soldiers program, and I uh, chose to be a engineer uh, for heavy construction equipment. Uh, the, after finishing basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey, I was sent to the engineering uh, army engineering school at Fort Belvoir, Virginia and I completed the course on heavy construction, maintenance, and repair of equipment. Oh, wow. Do you remember how old you were when you enlisted? I was 18 years of old age. Okay. And uh, why did you pick the service branch you joined, and why did you pick the Army? And the My older brother had been in the Army at the end of World War II, and uh, I kind of looked up to that situation, and I wanted to, uh, I thought I had an opportunity for a uh, for a career. Okay. And uh, can you tell me about your first days of service after you enlisted? Do you remember any of that? Or? Well, yeah, it was fight. As I said, from uh, New Haven, Connecticut, we were sent uh, directly to Fort Dix, New Jersey, which was basic training, and we did uh, eight weeks of training down there in, in the basic uh, infantry. Uh, area, and uh, from that point, after graduation from that, was when I was sent to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, to continue the engineering uh, part of uh, the program. And I did 14 weeks of training down there, and then uh, from that point, uh, we went on to Korea. And um, can you tell me a little more about boot camp, the experience? Well, boot camp was, well, I, it wasn't completely uh, new to me because I had served two years uh, in the United States Marine Corps Reserve uh, right here at the New London Submarine Base in, in Groton, where we did um, training uh, in Virginia, back to Virginia, and we did training on, on uh, summer uh, training facilities. There again, uh, the Marine Corps was an infantry outfit, so we did infantry training. So, so the, the, my experience is that uh, uh, Fort Dix appeared to fit into that 
kind of training, so it wasn't a real shock to me. Oh, okay. So you were in the Marines previous before you joined the Army, or? It was in reserve while I was in high school. Oh, okay. And how old around were you when you were in the Marine Corps? I was 17. 17, okay. And what, what was the change? What just made you kind of decide to change from the Marine Corps to the Army? Because the Marine outfit I was in was an infantry outfit. Oh, okay. And I, I wanted to. Not to be in the infantry, <laughs> yeah. but unfortunately, uh, things changed when we got to Korea. Okay. Uh, and uh, can you tell me a little about your training in uh, in Georgia and the engineering? Or? In Virginia. Yep. Yeah. In Virginia, uh, we uh, were in a uh, a, a school, uh, the eighty fifth Construction uh, Battalion School where we did 14 weeks, we actually uh, took apart diesel engines and we repaired bulldozers, we re repaired cranes, uh, heavy equipment movement, uh, uh, larger vehicles and things. We uh, went through the complete uh, construction of repairing and uh, making sure the engines ran, welding and all the other things that came with that. Wow. That sounds like a lot of technical things to remember. Um, did the, the now was it most in the classroom kind of training and then? No, well, it was. Oh, did, we had some classroom, but most of it was in the field. Okay. Actually, working on the and then in the in the uh, facilities where we would bring in the uh, the broken down equipment and repair it. Okay. And uh, what was a regular day like? Your assignments while uh, while training. The uh, engineering program. Well, we had some uh, uh, basic uh, formations and, and, and marching, but most of the time we would just march to the class. We'd go through that uh, uh, the eight, seven, or eight hours, and then we would march back to our barracks area, and then we were on our own to to do what we wanted to go to the exchange or things of that nature. Okay. Uh, so where did you go after after training there? Well, from that point, uh, once we graduated, the second day after graduation, the entire class of 25 men, we were put on a train, and we left Fort Belvoir, and we went to Chicago. And then from Chicago, we got on another train and went Northern Pacific Air, uh, uh, train to the uh, state of Washington. And we uh, were there at Fort Lawton, Washington, which was in actually in in the in the city of Seattle. Uh, no longer exists, but it was there. We uh, stayed for two weeks there, and we were told we were going to be put on a uh, large troop transport for Korea. But uh, the second uh, week. Uh, 80, uh, 85 of us were sent by bus to Vancouver, British Columbia. And from there, we, we were put on Canadian Pacific Airlines, and we were flown by way of Vancouver to Alaska, to the Aleutian Islands, and then to Japan. And we unloaded in Japan in two days at Camp Drake, in Tokyo area. Then we were shipped to Sasebo, Japan, which is in the southern portion of Honshu Island. And then we were transported from there by Japanese uh, steamers across the, uh, the uh, Sea of Japan to Pusan, Korea. And then at Pusan, we were instructed that we were no longer engineers. We were now part of the 2nd Infantry Division. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it was that quick that we changed. Yeah. And at that time, the 2nd Division was on its way back from North Korea after the battle of that area, and they were in pretty bad shape. So um, from that point on, we, we stayed infantry. And how long about did that travel take to get all the way from, was it Virginia to Korea? Six days. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot of traveling. <laughs> um, 
And uh, during your time in Korea, can you kind of explain the first week while you were there? Well, the first three days, we were on a train. It was a ancient train, but it didn't make its way up to the, up to the town of Taegu. From Taegu, we took trucks on to the uh, town of Wanju. At that time, the second division was located somewhere north of us, coming back down out of the battle of North Korea. Uh, the second day we were there, we were informed that the second infantry division was in a major conflict in above Wanju at the town of Hansong. And we were unassigned, but we went as a group north in trucks to a area that was a pass between two mountains, two hills. And we were told to set up defensive positions in that area and wait for, uh, we had to keep the pass open while the second and all of their equipment were coming south. And uh, during the next two nights, we had to uh, uh, fight skirm skirmishes with infiltrators or whatever, whoever they were, we weren't sure. But uh, the division got out through that area and we uh, then pulled back to Wanju area and then we were assigned to Pacific units, and that's where I was assigned to uh, C Company or Charlie Company of the 38th Infantry Regiment. And from that point, we stayed in a regroup area while new men like ourselves and the old men kind of mixed and trained and got together and knew where we were going. And uh, then we uh, moved from that point uh, directly into a patrol base. And from that point, uh, we went on patrols um, going north to see just where the North Koreans might be. And uh, the second patrol, we were ambushed by machine gun fire. And that's where I won the Congression. <laughs> Got something on my mind. Excuse me. The the combat infantry badge, and that's when you have to get. Now we went through combat earlier, but there was nobody to witness that. So we had witnesses that we got shot at. So we was awarded the combat infantry badge, yeah. which is a prestigious award. And then uh, uh, a couple of more patrols, we were pulled back into reserve and regrouped and, uh, and had some replacements coming in. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that point, uh, then uh, we stayed fairly calm for uh, two or three weeks. And then we were pushed out again in a forward motion through uh, the mountain area. I'm not positive, uh, it was north of us and more to the east of us, and uh, at that point, we didn't uh, come into any heavy contact with the enemy until uh, we were then placed in a defensive position that was called the No Name Line. They had various defensive lines uh, signed. They had the Kansas line. They had the, uh, uh, a number of other, but for some reason they never placed a name on this defensive line. And our whole uh, regiment was moved forward. We set, set up defensive positions and um, we were very close to Able Company, or A Company. Uh, they were on Mountain 1051, and we were on Mountain 914 to their east. And we stayed there till May the 16th. 
just to uh, oh, I'm sorry. Just to backtrack now, because uh, you gave me a lot of information. Oh, I'm sorry. I got uh, no. That's fine. Um, just to get the general experience of when you got there. Now, did they give you any training, pre- like preliminary training, of what it was going to be like when you went to the country, of like the language or anything, or no? Uh, in fact, is we had very we had very small contact with uh, with we had an. Uh, a Korean uh, rock or Republic of Korea uh, interpreter with us. Every outfit had one. And so we never really met in, uh, we, we took, when well, we went through villages and so forth and checked villages out, we never really had too much contact with the civilians or those, uh, you know, of, of that uh, situation. And then, of course, it got worse as we moved into the mountains. We never saw nobody except the enemy. And, uh, but uh, as far as training, the only training they gave us was bayonet practice. We had to have, we had done that in basic training, you know, we put the bayonet on the M1 rifle and do this. And, and, you, and you, know, you never got that close to the, enemy, you hope you didn't, that you'd have to use a bayonet, but, uh, and I never did, I never, I made sure I wasn't that close. Did they give you any training with, uh, because you had switched over from engineering, did they uh, train you beforehand, or did they just tell you? you Nope, you were just assigned to an infantry outfit, they figured you had infantry basic training. Wow. And, uh. And like I said, when we regrouped up after the Battle of Wanju and Hong Song, is when we went through some preliminary um, close order uh, functions, more or less making sure that we operated by squads. We each each uh, company had a platoon, and that was broken down into squads of of, of eight to nine men squads. So we had to learn and operate with those fellas, but that was about all the training we had. And uh, did you grow a strong bond with the squad that you were in? It very close, very close, and uh, over the time, it's a it's a uh, a bond. It's it's hard to explain. And uh, I know you've you've been in combat. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, well, in the May defensive line, we were sent out on patrols to find the enemy. That's a, 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 what they say, a search and contact, and that was the object. So we went out on the 16th of May in a uh, platoon size, that was 30-some men, 38 men. We went out on a platoon size patrol and we had to contact a uh, Republic of Korea ranger outfit that was out there somewhere uh, in front of us, and we did. And uh, they were pretty well encamped and pretty well in. So we went past them uh, about a half a mile, and then we came under heavy uh, fire, and two of our men were hit. Uh, I was not. I was in the first squad. First squad got hit first, and then we uh, had to extract them and continue the fire as we pulled back. And uh, the two men. We only had one stretcher with us, so uh, the platoon sergeant sent myself and the rock interpreter to the ranger. Uh, outfit to get another stretcher and on the way to that area we came under the two of us came under fire and we uh, took care of the situation and uh, moved on to the rock uh, uh, position and, and brought the stretcher back so we could c- carry these two wounded men back to the lines and we were about a mile and a half out in front of the lines so it, it took a while to get them back. Was but, this your uh, first experience in combat? Uh, other than that 
Wanju area and then on the on the patrol where we became came under fire but this was the first time with close combat with the enemy how was that experience for you uh pretty shaking i mean you do what you have to do by that time you know i'd been there for a couple of months so I, you know it wasn't uh, that it was we it was well expected sooner or later but uh, at that point, we hadn't, hadn't had close combat. And uh, what other uh, experience of combat did you uh, go through in Korea? Well, at that same, the following two days, we were hit by thousands of Chinese. Uh, they overwhelmed able company on 1051 either killed or captured all of the company they moved past us for some unknown reason they attacked and wiped out our company cp which it wasn't too far from us our commanding officer was taken prisoner we learned later but as we stayed during the night on 914 we were informed that as the next morning we were attacked by Chinese. Five or six of them came into our or at our positions, and we all fired at them and took them out. And then we were ordered to move back along the ridge line because we were isolated from our uh, rest of our outfit. Fox Company of the 23rd was east of us, and they said, see if you can make it to Fox Company of the 23rd. We started back along the ridge line, and when we reached Fox Company, unfortunately, we drew friendly fire from them that injured uh, three or four of our men before, we, before they recognized who we were. And we stayed with them that night, uh, brought in artillery, uh, which was anti-personnel artillery. We had to get down in our holes, and this artillery came down on top of us, knocking out the infiltrators. And the next morning, we were ordered to move out south of that position and try to join the rest of the 23rd. So we led, I don't know how we got chosen, but we were led, we led Fox Company out opportune and we reached the uh, road area off of the ridge line and we met the tanks from the, the second, uh, 72nd Tank Battalion was moving up the road to try to meet with us. We met with them and we went back down to the the entire escape route, whatever that road was, and all of the vehicles of the 23rd were lined up, taking out the people. And the first tank ahead of us uh, hit. Uh, it came across the a bridge that went across the Hong Hong Song River, and it blew up the bridge and the tank. And uh, the second tank moved up and uh, went to the side of the bridge to see if they could get across the river. And that one blew up. So we knew that they had gotten behind us with mines and had laid mines. And at that point, uh, we were ordered to abandon the vehicles, cross the river the best we could and rejoin on the other side of the river. Now the river was about knee deep, so we went across there and we were drawing fire. And that is when I got hit the first time. I, uh, something hit my rifle and uh, it deflected and of course it, it uh, did a job on my left hand and also and on my left arm, but I didn't realize I was wounded till I got to the other side of the river. And I draw, lost my rifle and uh, two guys there bandaged me up, and then we moved south um, until we joined the French battalion. 
and there they had an aid station, and they took care. There was five or six of us wounded, and uh, they patched us up, and we put on ambulances, and then we went to the MASH hospital. Consequently, I was then transported to Japan, rebandaged, refixed, and retied up, and then I sent, was sent back to duty. And what happened after that? When I got back to duty, we were still in major conflict, uh, the, the regiment and everybody. We were up in the Punch Bowl area, which was next to Heartbreak Ridge. You might have heard of Heartbreak Ridge. The 23rd Regiment was on Heartbreak Ridge. The 9th Regiment was on Bloody Ridge. And we were in the Punch Bowl area. And it's called the Punch Bowl because it's, it's, it's an old volcano, and it's shaped just like a, a, a punch bowl. And the first Marines, well, we took the first hill, 1179, and um, we got hit by our own airplanes as we got near the top of the hill. And we lost quite a few men. What had happened is that the Rock Marines had tried to take the hill and they could, got pushed off, but they had called for the airstrike. And when they came back off, they never told anybody. Consequently, when the jets came in, and the only thing that saved most of us is that they were jets, they overflew a lot of it, but a lot of the napalm and machine gun, uh, uh, we lost. Pretty close. The company lost uh, 50 some odd men in that. But we continued up and we took 1179 because mo a, lot of the, a lot of that airstrike also hit the Chinese and took them out. So we took that hill and then we were uh, moved across the ridge line because the 23rd was on heartbreak and was getting pounded by the Chinese that were ahead of us on the ridge line. So we moved towards Hill 1243. And uh, in that area, we, uh, uh, I was at that time, I was the assistant squad leader. And uh, we were moved to a position of confronting the enemy and uh, we were put my, my my squad leader was informed to move to the to the left of the conflict and try to wipe out a couple of machine guns. And uh, when the squad leader and, and the first scout got out into that area, they stepped on landmines. And we didn't realize it wasn't landmines until I thought we thought first they were just throwing things at us. I immediately took over the squad and uh, dispersed the men, went after the squad leader, and I inadvertently stepped on a landmine. And uh, But we got the squad leader and the other man back out, and uh, they put us on stretchers and carried us out back to Hill 1179. And then we were at the... Uh, forward aid station, and then went on to the MASH hospital and consequently went to Japan. And, uh, and consequently in Japan, things got worse and I, they had to amputate my left leg. So I uh, went through that and then uh, after recovery, uh, they flew me back to the States. And uh, with the during your time in Korea, do you remember anything about your commanding officer? Yes, well, uh, uh, Roger White was our commanding officer. Uh, he later, as I said, in that conflict in May, he uh, was captured. He went to a prisoner of war camp, and we learned later he was returned in that patriation of, in 1953. He did come back, uh, but he uh, uh, became unavailable after that point. He just, I guess he'd went through some horrible times. And uh, you said you 
you took over your squad. What, what did you need? Can you go into detail about that? When you well, were... immediately, once the squad leader's down, uh, it was my job to take over the, the, the uh, directing the other seven men. And I dispersed them accordingly, told them to hold their positions and things of that nature. It's, it's kind of an instant type of thing. And uh, then I knew that I had to go get uh, Danny, so I went out there and uh, just prior to getting to him, I stepped on a mine myself. But I was cognizant enough where I could grab him and pull him back with me. And we pulled out. The, the other fellows went after... Uh, the other, uh, the other, the, the, the lead, I can't, his name escapes me at the moment. But anyways, they got him back out too. By that time, we had also called in fire, which I did. I had, I had called in, uh, we had mortar fire that took out the machine gun. So really, we didn't have to advance, but that was our job at the time. And um, did you, you were, were you ever a prisoner of war? And around how long were you in Korea? Were you stationed? I was there nine months. Nine months, okay. And how did you stay in touch with your family while you were stationed in Korea? Well, we were were able to write uh, uh, the uh, the air mail type of um, uh, letters that they furnished us. It was a package type of thing. You could fold them up and and that way. And I I would write back and forth whenever I had a chance. And uh, what was the food like? Food was canned food, and uh, I was uh, saw a big difference from the first time when I went came back. They had a lot of different menu, <laughs> so, but they were, you know, it was, uh, you had the, the canned beans and, and Vienna sausages, you had the lima beans and ham, and you had the, all in the cans, and of course they would give us these packages that we would have the three meals for the day, and uh, they also included a can of uh, where you had your coffee or chocolate, and then you had a chocolate bar and a thing. Now these packages that we were using had been packed, and were in a warehouse somewhere since 1946. <laughs> So they were like rations. The only thing I ever used my bayonet for was to break up the chocolate bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. And uh, did you always have enough supplies while most of We you did. Know? Now, of course, there was all kinds of reports there. Of course, when we were in the, in the punch bowl area, there was all kinds of reports that we were running out of am uh, mostly artillery ammunition. And um, we always had artillery fire. Whenever we called for covering fire or anything like that, so I don't know just where. It may have been on some of the other front areas or somewhere. But that, that was the only time I ever heard that. But, but we always had small arms fire uh, ammunition. We had plenty of M1 machine gun, 45s, whatever we were carrying. Uh, we always and plenty of hand grenades. You use many, many hand grenades. But we are never, never, never. Uh, as long as I was there, we was never without adequate. And what about food supplies? When you food supplies, we always had our. In fact, it was, it was uh, surprisingly when I got back, they were actually bringing hot meals up. Uh, the South Korean uh, uh, civilian corps. Uh, would bring up hot meals once a day up on the line. Did you ever have any of the local Korean food or? No. no. We were we were told not to. We were told to stay, you know, not. They had a concoction of cabbages to call kimchi and some of the guys would try that, but I, I just never had a flavor for that. And um, did you ever feel pressure or stress during your service? No, many times. Many times. Can you describe I have, it to me? Well, I have post-traumatic stress syndrome, and um, it's just something that you just, it's it just that you're always on edge, uh, especially at night time. It was worse because you just, it was always the unknown factor. You didn't know who was out there, who was around you. 
And I think it, it got kind of difficult to do fighting it. Uh, uh, you just, you know, you knew somebody was in front of you that, that you just fired at and so forth. And uh, But the daytime it was a little bit different, but it was still a lot of stress. And did you ever do any good luck rituals or anything special for good luck? No, I prayed a lot. Carried a second, a new, a new testament with me that was with me today. I always uh, thought, if anything, God was going to get me out of there. And uh, how did uh, people entertain themselves while you were you and your squad? How did you entertain yourselves? Not much. We just cleaned the weapons, and uh, we maybe talked about. Uh, you know, some of our experiences from high school or something like that, or talk about family and things of that nature. We never got to see a Bob Hope show or anything <laughs> like that. We never got taken off the line to see any entertainment. There was a lot of entertainment over there. I've read a lot of reports about all of the, the different uh, groups uh, Eddie Cantor and uh, and all these people that came to see, but I no, we never USO shows or anything like that. Nothing. Nothing. We were always in those mountains, and uh, we stayed there. And um, so, kind of to go back to the uh, more of your time, kind of in battle. Can you tell me about some of the battle planning that was involved, or? Well, we never got into much of the planning. Uh, you know, the orders would come down from regiment. We always assumed it was from regiment. They would come down to the companies, and the company commanders then would pass. We had a, a, a platoon leader who was a first lieutenant, and uh, and uh, the orders would go usually to the platoon sergeant. The platoon sergeant was the connecting to anything that was going to go on. He would get the squad leaders together and then tell them, hey, this is what we're going to do and this is what we're going to have to do. And he kind of, the platoon sergeant ran the show. He was the guy and, uh, and fortunately we had a man from World War II. And he was a, a, a we call him retreads, <laughs> uh, left over from World War II. But God bless him, because he was the guy that knew what was going on. Do you remember his name? Uh, Charles Chestnut. He was from North Carolina, talked with a heavy drawl, <laughs> loved him. And uh, he took care of us. And can you tell me about the medals or citations in which you received while well in the military? Yes, well, at first, I, first thing I was proud of was the, was the combat infantry badge. That's the badge with the rifle that you carry on your breast, the highest award. I got two Purple Hearts for being wounded twice. Wow. Uh, the Korean War Medal, Service Medal, I had three battle stars. One was for the Battle of Wanju, one was for the May massacre and the second was for the punch bowl so I carry three battle stars on the on that and then the United Nation medal everybody that served there was we were a, this was a United Nations war a lot of people don't realize that but we were a part of the United Nations not uh, the actual US Army although we were predominantly US Army 8th Army but there was uh, 17 other fact that we had the French, excuse me, I got off the track, uh, Purple Heart, I had the, the, the Korean service with three battle stars, had the uh, United Nations medal, had the National Defense medal, and uh, and then we also, uh, for the May massacre, we were presented the Presidential Unit Citation. The Second Infantry Division was awarded that citation for making the stand that we did. Although my comments may look like we were, but we actually blocked 
and they estimated there was 230,000 North Koreans that attacked us. And we had, second division would have had around uh, five or 6,000 men. And we stopped them, they didn't get any further than us. And uh, also we received the Korean Presidential Unit Citation for the Wanju Hansong area. And then later on, the um, South Korea presented us individually with the prestigious Republican of Korea War Service Medal. And that came from the ambassador um, through, and they, they met because they just mailed it to me. I got mine in the mail, which was fine but it was a very prestigious thing to receive. Wow. And uh, to go back, you were talking about the United Nations War. Uh, can you explain that? Well, when North Korea attacked South Korea, we were kind of like a, they were like a protector of the United States. President Harry Truman said, we will defend South Korea. So we will send forces to South Korea Congress was a little bit balking on that situation. And then they took it to the United Nations because this was a violation of the United Nations charter and everything else. It was an on, uh, just an overt attack onto a, 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 of another nation. Immediately, British came right to our side and France came to our side. And then as it went on, there was actually 17 other nations that joined together. And that's why we went in there under the United Nations command. Eighth Army, we came directly under military. U.S. Army ran the show. Uh, we had the French battalion was with the 23rd Infantry Regiment. We had the Dutch or Netherlands uh regiment with us and uh, they had, we had uh, units from Greece, we had units from Ethiopia, uh, now there were a number of India and Sweden sent hospitals. I was, when I was coming out I, it was, I, had, I stayed at the Swedish hospital in Busan for two or three days while they got me ready to go into Japan. So uh, I mean there were other uh, non-combative operations, but it was 17 different nations that were part of the United Nations war effort. And it, we had Air Force units from um, South Africa had an Air Force unit. And uh, they were in Australia had not only Air Force, but they had infantry. <coughs> the British had Air Force and infantry also. Many of the outfits were uh, were uh, uh, the various royal battalions that the British had. Did you ever work with any of these different groups? Uh, different well, we countries? worked very closely. We had the Dutch with us, and we worked with them. We always got upset because they always got their wine rations, and we. <laughs> and they they would flaunt it once in a while, but uh, yeah. Uh, so I mean that was something that was you know very re remembered very well. But anyways, uh, well Australians uh, were were uh, at one time where there, but most of those outfits stayed over towards the Seoul area. Um, uh, I, don't, I, I don't remember any other major outfits actually being with us other than those uh, battalions, but uh, they were very prominent. Turkey had a, a fabulous outfit there. I, I, this is a lot of things that I've read about afterwards, the fact, but I was a, kind of a, I studied it just to see where I was and what was going on and things of that nature. So. Uh, at the time, you don't know where you are. You just, it's hard to tell one mountain from another. Okay. Uh, so, anyways. 
And uh, you were talking about the May Massacre. Were you involved in that? Yes, that was the May uh, from 16. Why they call it, the, they call it actually the Battle of the No Name Line was the official. Every GI know it as the May Massacre because we, and there's an article in here, I don't know, we had uh, Colonel John L. Coughlin was our regimental commander. And he made a statement to Time Magazine is that uh, he was proud of his men fighting and they had to wade through enemy troops to come out with blood on their boots. The only blood on my boots was my blood. <laughs> so, but it was a, it was a something that they wrote up in this. You will read that in this story, mm -hmm. on and that it was commonly known. And in fact, is the press was very prominent by calling it the May Massacre, and we slaughtered. Uh, I don't know. Like I said, a hundred. The presidential unit citation said they had evidence of a hundred and twenty thousand. North Korean and Chinese that, that attacked us. But out of that, thousands and thousands of them we wiped out. A lot by artillery fire, a lot by combat fire. And uh, well, like I said, I don't, I can only relate to about 10 or 15 of them that we had in our area where we took care of. And uh, what what was the uh, what was that experience like for you during the uh, the May massacre? During Horrific. The Horrific. It was the first time that we really had major major uh, contact with the enemy, and uh, of course going through the night time and then actually observing them uh, <clears throat> taking ten fifty one and overwhelming those fellows also. Uh, uh, them taking over our CP when they captured uh, Captain White, and that was difficult. And then, of course, the experience of getting back to Fox Company. We didn't have a clue, and then, you know, we got hit by friendly fire, which it was not their fault. They had no way of knowing. Well, they knew we were coming, but they didn't know who we were. So, I mean, it was very tough. Uh, and then, of course, the experience of getting wounded was, I never thought I was ever going to get wounded. And, uh, yeah, it was pretty tough. And did you ever get a chance, I know you didn't get a chance to go to any USO shows, but did you ever get any time for R&R? &R no. No. Okay. My R&R &R came from going back to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Now, did you recall any particularly humorous or humorous or unusual events that happened during your time? Well, I did kind of a stupid thing. I uh, we were sitting there waiting for this attack to come. This was in May, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a bird in Korea, and it lit right out in front of our, our foxhole. I was with a fellow named Jameson from Erie. Uh, uh, and I'm sorry, not Erie. Yeah, Erie, Pennsylvania. And uh, I said, look at that, isn't that a bird? He said, oh, and I looked again. And he, so I just took a pot shot at the, <laughs> hit the limb and the limb blew and thank God the bird got away. But the fellows always hollered at me for starting the war. <laughs> when we, they said, you started all this stuff. What did you matter? Because the, 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 the platoon sergeant come down and want to know why when there was a shot fired. Said something was moving out there, but I didn't dare tell him it was a bird. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you or any of your uh, squad members ever pull any pranks or do anything funny, or was it just all serious business? No, it was mostly we just stayed the business. There was a lot of kidding, I guess, going on back and forth, uh, you know, and uh, or you'd show your picture of your girlfriend or something, and they'd say, oh, is she ugly or something, you know, well, you know, just that kind of stuff. But yeah. uh, nothing, uh, any really, it was all business. And um, can, can you explain to me a little more about uh, the way you felt about your officers and your fellow servicemen? Well, we, also, we had very little contact with them. Um... 
We had a lieutenant in our platoon who wasn't, wasn't too liked. And uh, there were reasons for that that I won't go into. But uh, it was kind of strange because he was a Mustang. He was a guy that came up through the ranks and then they made him a lieutenant. But he, he just didn't seem to be the, the leader type guy. And that's why I, Sergeant Chestnut ran the platoon. He took care of things and got us in and out of different situations. And did you ever keep a journal during your service? No. no. And uh, what was your the highest rank you received during your service? That was corporal. Corporal, okay. And uh, who were you keeping in contact with while you were in Korea? Well, mostly the family. Mostly the family. And, uh, and that was about it. Where were you when you received your service ended? Did you, uh, where did you go back to after? Well, when they brought me back, I had quite an experience when they got me back because they flew me from Japan to Hawaii, and from Hawaii they flew me into uh, Travis Air Force Base in California. I'll go into a little dissertation here, if you don't mind, because it's a story in itself. Yeah, please do. From Travis, I was in the hospital there at the station hospital at Travis, two or three days, and I kept saying, well, these fellows, there would be a four-room bed, guys were coming and going, so I asked the Red Cross lady, what, you know, she, oh, they, she said, well, you'd be out of here in a couple of hours, and I said, I've been here three days. The next thing, some an officer and two nurses showed up, and I explained to them I'd been here, and they said, okay, we're going on the next plane, which was the following morning. So we flew. I was supposed to be going to, now, I was in a body cast at that time, we were trying to hold things in place, a half body cast, so I wasn't movable. So we left. And I asked the flight nurse, says, where are we headed? And I said, name rank serial number. said, you're going to Waltham Army Hospital. Uh, you're going to Murphy Army Hospital, Waltham, Massachusetts. Okay. I don't remember how long it was, but anyways, the plane landed. They came in and took four guys off for the plane on stretches, me being one of them. Took us over by ambulance to a hospital and they checking us out. And this doctor kept calling me by a sergeant such and such. And I said, no, no. And finally gave him name, rank, and serial number. And the nurse says, well, that's the file that came off with him. They had taken the wrong guy off the plane. So I had to stay overnight at Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas. Was fortunate to meet a, uh, one of the corpsmen in the hospital was from Norwich, Connecticut. What a small coincidence. Next day I left where they flew me up to Westover Air Force Base here in Massachusetts. And they sent me over to Fort Devons, Mass, which was then an Army post. And there they asked, why did they send me? Why was I sent there? And I I don't know. I'm supposed to be going to a Army Hospital in Waltham, Mass. And they can't take care of you there either. So I said, all right. So two weeks later, they put me back on a plane and flew me to a new amputation center of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So I got to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. They took the cast off and cleaned me up and got me into some therapy and things like that. And then they came around and said, where's your hometown? I said, oh, Groton, Connecticut. And they said, okay, we're going to get everybody close to home for Christmas. This was Christmas of 52. So put me back and put me in a uniform because I was now traveling on crutches. Took off. We flew to Battle Creek, Michigan. And I went to Percy Jones Army Hospital right in Battle Creek, which was the old Kellogg Hotel. And they said, well, you can't go home for Christmas because you're not in good shape. I'm going. So 
they finally gave me some leave. We went home by train. There was five of us, all on crutches. We didn't have any prosthesis. Diseases. We were just so. Anyways, we got home and then we. So when I went back, I said, "I'm going to ask for a transfer. I got to get closer to home," because that took. I can't remember how, how many hours we got stuck in Baltimore. I mean, in uh, Buffalo. So anyway. I, congressman got, my congressman here got involved in it through my father, which was a taboo, but they, he had me transferred to Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington, D.C. So they transferred me from uh, Battle Creek, Michigan to uh, Washington. And like I said, in Washington was when I got a little bit of an honor that uh, when we were invited, uh, they picked guys. First nobody went, and then they said, you, 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 you go. So we went, and we arrived on the White House lawn. On the, I guess, I don't know, it's, it's a site that has the balcony and the staircase come off of it. And they had all these dignitaries lined up, and they said, uh, President and Mrs. Truman will be down in a minute. So we, they lined us up wheelchairs and then the guys on crutches and this and that. So they started the procession. He came down and then, then they started the procession. They went through. I don't know how it happened, but they stopped the line somewhere. The guy came to me and said, stop. I said, stop. I don't do you when you're in the army, you do what you're told. So. The general came over and said, well, come on, come on. He said, we got to get our cameras fixed. So they fixed them. Come on with the line. And then they took my pictures being the first to shake hands with Harry Truman. Wow. And it made all of the newspapers. And this was probably the highest thing in my whole life was where I met that at the time I, uh, of course, he just said, well, you know, he, he said a few, I don't remember exactly what he said, but when I got to Mrs. Truman, we had these name plates on us, Corporal Hart, Groton, Connecticut. She said, oh, Groton, Connecticut. We're coming up, going, we're going up there next week because uh, uh, the president has to initial the Nautilus uh, he has to put his initials in the keel of the Nautilus. I didn't even know what the Nautilus was. I hadn't been back in that long. So it was quite an adventure. I was always honored by that, even though it was a little bit on the phony side. But hey, you take take advantage of what it is. So anyway, that's, that was that story. Wow. And um, so what happened after that? Did you go back to the, the hospital? Or? Well, yeah. Well, I stayed in the hospital. Of course, as I said, I one of the, I guess I'm probably one of the luckiest guys in the world, really, in the Army. I had signed up, as I said in the beginning, as a career soldier. And because that was in effect at that time, I had to go before my medical board. Uh, once they said they got me in the prosthesis and we went through the training of walking and all that, but they said, okay, now you're ready, we're ready for duty. So said, you can go back to duty, but you're gonna have to change your MOS, which is the, your operation thing. You can't be infantry, you can't be engineers. I said, well, man. uh I had to meet with a JAG officer to represent me before the medical board. And he said, you, you don't want to go back to duty. I said, no. And he says, well, they can give you compensation and, and uh, tabulate years of service and things. Like that. But under the career program, they could medically retire you. And I said, what does that mean? He said, that would mean you'd have all the benefits of a man that did 20 years of service because of this career program that you volunteered for. That sounds good for me. 
I, I wasn't too sure. You know, I was only 19 or so at the time and going on 20. I said, so I listened to him and he represented me and that's what they did. They retired me for medical disability. So I received all the benefits of a retiree. Wow. And to this day, I've been very grateful. My wife, when she was alive, had all of the benefits from her insurances and things of that nature. So although it was a tough time, uh, they came through at the end. Uh, I was a little bit discouraged. And I, I, told, I told the major, the, the JAG officer, I said, I can't trust the Army. I said, I, too many different things have happened. And I don't mean that as a sour note. It just said, hey, I, 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 I was very honest with them. So anyways, that's what I, I, I retired, came home and uh, and took my life on from there. And what was the homecoming like when you finally came home? Well, I got off the train in New London and uh, the train had pulled into the station, New London station, and I had to get off the train about two or three cars back and walk through the gravel <laughs> to get up to where my mother and grandfather were waiting for me and uh, that was it. I got in the car and they drove me home and uh, that time we lived down here on Thames Street near, right on the river and um, pretty much that was it. There wasn't any really homecoming and there wasn't much uh, fanfare. Well, I'm sure they were happy to see you home. All oh, the parents and everything. Oh, yeah. Well, the family flocked in, you know. We uh, we had a few uh, gatherings and things of that nature. But uh, that was about it. And uh, what did you do in the days or weeks afterwards once you came home? Well, I decided I was going to go to college out of the GI Bill because they were giving me an education. And where did you go to school? Mitchell College. Okay. It was, it's here in New London, uh, and I uh, I uh, got a degree from there, and then I went, uh, I uh, was in the auxiliary police department in the town of Groton. It was a little unique Groton because we got this. It's made up of a number of boroughs. The fact is, this part of the town used to be the borough of Groton. It's now the city of Groton. Then we got the town, Groton Long Point, and uh, Mystic, uh, on on the Mystic side, on the east side, I mean, the, the west side of the river is Groton. You go across that bridge of the river and you're in the town of Stonington. So you're familiar with it. So, but, at that time, I was on the auxiliary, which we, we didn't do too much, but uh, an opening came here in the borough of Groton Police Department. I said, I'm going to put in for it. They'll never take you, not with a bad leg and all that. I said, well, you know, this was 1955, yeah, 55, 55, 56. So I put in for it. And they picked me. <laughs> wow. So I said, well, the fact is, they said, well, we had to check. They, they checked. Nowhere in the state of Connecticut at that time was there an active patrolman that had artificial leg. I said, well, hell, I said, I can always be the first. I was first in line <laughs> with Harry Truman. So I got, and I was on there for six years. And, uh, my wife hated the midnight trick. She hated me being a police officer. But I did six years here. And uh, see, there was no academy back in those days. I never, you, you couldn't have done it with today's uh, because it just wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't able to do all that. But I did six years and then I went to an electric boat company. And uh, with my degree and so on, I went down there and I, uh, did 29 years down there and uh, was very successful. Moved to the different areas and uh, worked with the nuclear projects on the engine room and reactors. 
and that was very, very good, good to me. Now, what did you uh, get your degree in? A fact is, I did it only in business administration. Oh, wow. <laughs> so when I got to EB, of course, I had worked a little while at the submarine base in their accounting department, because I did the accounting and everything. I thought I was going to be an accountant. But when I got to EB, they needed uh, uh, specs and standards and material people. So I moved into that area. And then from there, I moved on up into the nuclear projects over the time, and I became a material analyst handling specifications and standards for the reactor and engine room for the submarine, and also for the CGN missile cruisers from Quincy. We, we had Quincy uh, missile cruisers as well as submarines. And you said you went uh, back to school with the GI Bill? Uh, the GI Bill, right. And um, with the, the servicemen you met, um, did you keep in touch with any of them? Yes. Yep. Do you still today? They've all passed. Oh, okay. I have one man that was from, not my outfit, but from the hospital. He's still alive down in uh, New Jersey. We communicate back and forth. Well, we, uh, we had gone down a few times and things. He lives in Brick, New Jersey. I said, boy, they must have had a tough time to name it a town. They named it Brick. It's down right on the coast. But uh, John was in the hospital with me. He was with the 1st Cavalry Division and was very seriously injured, too. So uh, we keep in contact. I just, I've lost, uh, I had fellows in, in uh, Texas and Georgia and uh, Ohio, and they were, they're all gone now. And how did you keep in contact with them? We just communicated, well, mostly by phone, but I would, we'd write back and forth Christmas cards, Thanksgiving cards, and things of that nature. Oh, that's nice. And, um, let's see. Uh, did you join any uh, veterans' organizations? Yes. And I, which uh, ones did you join? Well, my first outfit I joined was the Disabled American Veterans, and then I belonged to the Veterans of Foreign Wars and the American Legion, and uh, so I uh, kept pretty active in them. Uh, in the Disabled American Veterans, I uh, did all of the offices within the chapter of New Lynn, New London, and I was also the Junior Vice Commander of the State Department. So I, you know, in Veterans of Farm Wars, I just stayed locally with the local outfit. I was the post service officer for all of those groups where I took care of uh, helping people getting pensions and things of that, filling out forms and things of that nature. And uh, do you attend any of the reunions? The uh, last reunion I went to was in Massachusetts. The 2nd Infantry Division had a reunion up there. And uh, this uh, <laughs> fellow was from, uh, he, he lived over in um, Montville, which is across the river. And uh, believe it or not, he, we were in Korea together. He was with the 2nd uh, Division engineer. Oh, wow. <laughs> I said, I almost, almost made it, Herb. Didn't quite get there. <laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah, we enjoyed it. The wives and so forth, we we go. That was the last one I attended. It's, it's a little bit tough to travel now. And uh, how did your military experience influence uh, your thinking about the military in general? Well, I, I, I might have sound a little negative, but I, I enjoyed it. When I look back and what happened and the different things, there were some tough times. And I didn't want to keep a negative attitude. That's why I did a lot of research on it, try to figure out, well, not only where I was at, but more about the war. I read a lot of books on it and became uh, no more knowledgeable over actually what did happen, how what did take place. Because when you're there, you don't know what really what's going on other than your little circle. So, uh, I, you know, and I'm still very proud and uh, when I go to the schools, I have, a, believe it or not, I have a new uniform. I had to get the old one was so 
small. I only weighed 128 pounds. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, but anyways, uh, so I go to the schools and I enjoy it because the kids today, it's, it's, un, it's unbelievable. These uh, uh, junior high school children, how much they want to know. And I have a hel I take a helmet with them, with me, and I have uh, uh, equipment that we wear, our cartridge belts, and then uh, bayonet scabber and, and trenching tools and, and things of like that. And they just love to hear the stories about what you did with them, how you used them, and the mess kit we had to eat from. I mean, it's just it's very enjoyable to see their response. And uh, how did uh, your service and the experiences that you've gone through uh, affect your life overall? Well, I tried to, like I said, I, uh, oh, uh, I think it, it made me a better person uh, of what I went through. And uh, a lot of things I had to conquer, a lot of things I haven't really overcome completely. But uh, it doesn't bother me too much in talking about it and doing things, but I think it uh, it carried a little bit of weight when I was looking for employment and everything. And I was a veteran and was a you know a disabled veteran and things like that. And it, it does you know I'm sure it was taken into consideration. So I don't have any you know overall. I, and of course being. I, I just, uh, when I'm told people I've been retired, and they say, gee, would you retire as a as corporal? How long was you in there? Two and a half years. What? <laughs> and then just to see the look on their face, but then I have to explain it to them. And I, I'm not ashamed of it. The, the government gave it to me, and like I said, they took care of me in the end, so I'm very proud about that. And the Veterans Administration is, <coughs> excuse me, is available to you know, to, to, to take care of me. But I also see me being retired. I come under a, a, an insurance program where I can go to my own doctors. I don't have, the only time I have to go to the VA is because of my leg. And they have to take care of it or make me a new one or do whatever they do. And But any other time, I can go to regular medical doctors because I come under the TRICARE for Life program. So it, it's a great honor. It's a great... Uh, help. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to add that uh, I haven't included in the questions or anything of, of interest? I don't think I can give you too much more. <laughs> <laughs> I probably wore you down probably. Well, I'd like to thank you for your service, but also for taking your time for uh, and letting us uh, come and interview you. Well, I look at this as a great honor. When I heard about it, I, 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 I hadn't thought too much about it in the past year until your phone call, and then I said, yeah, okay, that sounds all right. So, I'm, you know, it just uh, seems to me that uh, this is something I would really enjoy happening, and I hope you can use the information. So I guess, you know, I, I do have a... Uh, it, fine, if you want to... I,